Pavlovnik Salivia, Sanoka Yarovnik, La Revolutionary Provoskia Nasemikia, Terdomia Laskiva de Tomsko de Boliski de Bovoskia, Postiskilia do Bierke, Lobieda, Karniskedeska, Kozigo Cheklovdas Yis Taknia, Ozina Skunia, Zebolia, Ni Yelshe von Pon Muskiva. Voruk, vi, yonavata, ka, onagana, masit, yovia, pamitia. Organa, mas. Eto blasnado, al pusheno, e, kazasa, yozima, eto, kiavit, sardonia, o, kanyota, vi, golili, nekolo, vimi, naza, gozoza. Kozia, kem, chadisia, onogo, Charles Wabaske. Eko. Eto namantati ye nim gazet. Kono yu nas bizye zi bi ofunia sa valusinendien opismia. Raska koja odin kolivia. Bliet uban uskizienaza anmina el gebel. Tazisa ekoya irboy shoya kashkinio vefia. Possidabil ish kadruskeneska kuzabak e buskera e nuskia chaletje. Marina Yanovna was a Russian child soldier and author of the Great War. She was born in Radiska, a small village near Kaznushira, the daughter of a colonel of the Cuban Cossacks. She was just 14 years old when her father went off to war in August 1914. Caught up in the adventure and the tradition of the Cossack women following their men into the front, she became a child soldier volunteer of the Russian army at the age of 14. Specifically, she joined the Russian reconnaissance Sainota, the 100 Horsemen Squadron, and the Ted Eskenodra Regiment. Yelovna published a three-part trilogy of her life at the age of 14 at the outbreak of the Great War to her eventual maturity and a life in the US. She ran away from home with a group of women who were also following their husbands and brothers into battle as a part of the Kuban Cossack group, which mobilized and traveled by train south towards Armenia and the Turkish enemy. She originally worked as an official volunteer army groom in Armenia. She was then mentored and protected by the sergeant of the army of the Caucasus named Kosli, who procured a uniform for Marina and was made into sort of the mascot of his unit. In 1915, she was on a dangerous mission in which Kosli was killed and she was shot in the leg while blasting bridges across the Annex River in Yadavan. She was treated at the Red Cross Hospital in Baku and then returned to the Southern Front where she would be trained in auto mechanics and become a military driver. As the war progressed, Armenia was devastated as she advanced with the army to the siege and the capture of Erdragon. She, she was assigned to a labor unit in 1917 where she was wounded during an artillery barrage and the ammo dump exploded which buried her alive with her head and one arm damaged and one arm above ground, unable to free herself. As, as the revolution ignited mass murders and riots, Cossacks like her became grouped and targets of extermination. She was nearly killed just trying to reach treatment for her injuries. She spent nearly an entire year of 1918 in the hospital in Moscow, suffering from concussions and an apparent neck trauma, as well as shell shock causing memory loss of the entire hospitalization period in which most of Moscow was destroyed and burned by revolutionaries, Today we know PSD as this mental and physical thing that happens at a sequence of events or words, but at such time, she had PSD, and most of the time it was either trench sickness, trench madness, or just cowardice to avoid the front. So the Bolsheviks actually thought she was crazy and she was thrown into the prison by the Bolsheviks, by where all the male prisoners were murdered while she was the lone female POW and was abandoned and locked into a cell by the Bolsheviks and was left there. She, con she continued to flee eastward by train across Russia in the winter. She was conscripted into the white Russian forces under the command of Captain Kalip. While weak with the lack of food and still not fully recovered from a previous Bolshevik attack, in the fight she was shot again through the armpit muscle and by the soldier by the Bolsheviks on the patrol after the battle. According to her autobiography, she was wrongly sent to the asylum of Umps for a period of about two weeks where she recovered from this room and from shell shock. Due to the intervention of a friendly officer, she was released and given passage and 500 rubles to travel to Vladivostok. 
The train she was a passenger on has stopped in the middle of the Siberian wasteland, sandwiched between two Bolshevik armies led by the contingents of the Russian officers. She abandoned the train along with a party of about 100 wolves, both men and women, and walked through Siberia for a month, evading war, destruction and the populace. Eventually reaching the Russian military hospital in Vladivostok, and this is where we end the first book of the trilogy. Her second book, Russia Farewell, demonstrates both her unique force of character and unique status as a female combat veteran, soldier volunteer. At the military hospital, she was placed into a small ward with a few senior officers, and she quickly became a staff favourite. By this stage of the long war and revolution, the collapse of national economy had already been caused by several years of food shortages and famine, lack of medical care, vanished government service, and total societal collapse. From warfare and the marauding gangs, pilgrimage and the massacres of villages all across the continent. The military who gave their all for the service of their nation to preserve life and order were hunted down and killed along with all their administrations, intelligentsia, businessmen, both large and small, clergy, royalty at all levels, whether rich or poor. The three weeks in Vladivostok described in depth the sense of loss and the place of a nation destroying itself at an unprecedented and an unparalleled scale. Nations from across the world ship supplies, relief organisations and both naval and land forces to the doom attempt to try and stop the mass murders and the warfare. The countries that at least had a foothold left on the areas of stability drew Marina to these forces and amidst the desperation she got in. Her military class ward mates provided her with the understanding of the skill of the parallel to the current conflict in the rift of the US society. The hospital was funded by the American Red Cross donations and the American doctors there approved of her evacuation. Marina said the hospital was quite perfectly run, quite perfectly kind. After recuperating there for about three weeks, she was given a passport and a passage to the sanatorium in Targuski, Japan. The three days aboard the ship was described in detail and after disembarking, she suffered another nervous breakdown en route to her destination. She doesn't describe her months of treatment but she openly describes her hard efforts and hard determination to succeed are uh, interrupted by sharp periods of panic against the backdrop of, of a destitute royal family, refugees now adrift on a desperate daily life in the vibrant Japan 12 years prior to the invasion of Manchuria. Her efforts to develop employable skills, memorize the English dictionary and fully embrace life as based upon her strong set of moral values instilled on her by her Cossack works and her Christian values and what Christianity has taught throughout her life. She remains a steadfast Christian throughout her life. During the first two books, she had repeatedly approached by men who wanted her for manners or didn't respect her at all. And she openly shared her conflicts in dealing with the result of the ongoing personalities with the moral values, progressively increasing into a sharp contrast with her expat group. While she matures from a girl to a woman, all things Russians collapse. Her encounters were dramatically stark and pugnant. The second book ends with her third flight away from turmoil to the US in 1922. The only woman picks up life from here, there. Was that girl let back into print in paperback during the centennial of the Great War broadcasted in the 14 diaries as well. However, there's little chance you're going to actually get to read these things in paperback, maybe on Amazon Prime. I have actually looked on Amazon Prime and not seen nothing for these books. So maybe they're not going to be republished, but Cossack Girl will always be in the store and in hardback or paperback. I'm not, you know, I'm not affiliated with Amazon or anything, but if you want to read the book. And uh, Russia Farewell is pretty rare and the editions of The Only Woman That Ever Was There is even more so rare. In 1922, she immigrated to the United States, where she performed as a dancer. She then married filmmaker William C. Heiner and became a U.S. citizen in 1926. She won several medals, mostly from England and France and other places like Serbia as well, the St. George's Cross of Bravery three times, being shot in Yanavan, being shot in the Russian Winter War, and I think the threat across Siberia gets a notable mention and the speech as well, which is actually um, the easter egg for the quote of this video, the longest Russian thing I've ever done, but let's get to the end of the episode. We're reading and actually listening to the documentary slash, you know, love, I, I, don't, I, I have a crush on your love now. But the books actually describe the Cossack Girl, which was um, printed in 1924, covered her life from 14 to the first five years of the war and the societal collapse of the Russian Empire, the second book, Russia Farewell, in 1936 was published 
and the last book seeing that they basically published two or three years apart the woman picks up from here and there it was published in 1936 but due to a couple royalty and legal disputes it was published in 1937 and that's why it's kind of rare because it has one of those lawsuits um, what do you call it um, developers hells developers hells or something like that it had one of those kind of hells it was done and everything was good but the publisher was like two books or something there's a bunch of legal marble jumbo but it was finally printed in 1936-1937, the only woman here and there, and it was widely and it was widely released to the public in 1938. In 1984, she died at the age of 84, from 1900 all the way to 1984. I'm not saying she could have lived, but if she saw 1991, that would have probably brought a tear to her eye, as the Russia she knew would actually have the Russian name back again. But, in popular culture, Yolovna was one of those women of the Great War, such as the Serbian women that fought the Battalion of Death, Maria Buskadova, the Austro-Hungarian women, no, not the Austro-Hungarian, the Romanian women that fought, mostly the notable female ones, and there was one British one, I can't remember every girl off the top of my head, Maybe when we do the Romanian season or something. I'm not saying there's going to be a Romanian season, but maybe a little, a little fight part or something. Because they did kind of capitulate in 1917, the end of 1917, so they are basically in the war for a year. But they do have a couple of great battles and a couple of figures and a couple of things to talk about. But she is also, notably, in one of the 14 main characters in the season and the... She is one of the 40 main characters in the series 14 Diaries of the Great War and she is played none other by the Bay, Natalia Whitmer. Uh, I mean she does a great job. I mean she is from Russia but she really does a great job capturing a 14 year old. I think she's like 20 or something as well. Or 16 I think. Or 17. Uh, 18. She's probably 18. Probably 18. But there you have it. The Warrior Woman. The Cossack Girl. Russia Farewell. And finally, the woman only picks up from there. She had a hot, she had a tough life. Her father was killed. Her father, bigger mentor, was killed. Mother was probably killed even from famines of the Ukraine, or even from the Caucasization, the Cossackization. I don't know how you say that word, but it is the removal of all Cossacks and everything Cossack within the new Soviet Union. And of course, she was shot multiple times. Trek through Siberia alone and finally making it to the US where she finally settled down, published her three books, married to a filmmaker and finally died in 1984 peaceful and quiet in New York or California, somewhere popular. But she is a great woman, one of the series, I don't know, I might do more women like this but I think her story kind of tops everyone. Maria Voskardova and Manina Yolova are pretty much neck and neck for badass females of World War One. But there are the females of World War One. Um, so, hope you learned something. This is the second time I'm recording this, so I wanted it to make it sound good. I mean, for the very Natalia with that. But hope you learned something. And you know, stay awesome, my friends. Learn something. Damn, 26 minutes, nice.